Hi, it's Tom here. And before we get into this week's podcast, I just want to tell you all about an exciting event that's taking place this weekend. That's the Battle of Ideas Festival. For us at Spikes, the Battle of Ideas is always one of the highlights of the year. Held at the Barbican and organised by the Academy of Ideas, it's two days of top-level debates with hundreds of panels and hundreds of speakers discussing the key issues of our time. Even better, it is a festival that takes free speech seriously. It's an unashamedly unsafe space in which all ideas can be aired and interrogated. Brendan O'Neill, Fraser Myers and myself will all be there this weekend discussing everything from Brexit to environmentalism to white privilege to the gilets jaunes. So to see the full programme and to get your tickets, just go to battleofideas.org.uk. That's battleofideas.org.uk. We hope to see you there. Now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to the Spike podcast. I'm Fraser Myers and joining me we have Spike's editor Brendan O'Neill. Hello. And Spike's deputy editor Tom Slater. Hello. Coming up on the show, the general election, the death of Al Baghdadi and Dave Chappelle's war on wokeness. Across the country there is a widespread view that this parliament has run its course. MPs have started clearing their commons desks, either because they're leaving the commons for good or to get back to their constituencies to campaign. The Labour Party loves a debate, but they also love the end of the debate. And this is the end of the debate and we're going out there to win, OK? The UK is finally going to have a general election. Boris Johnson's attempts to go to the polls were rejected three times by the House of Commons, but this week the Labour Party finally relented and have backed a public vote on the 12th of December. The zombie parliament, it seems, is finally coming to an end. Brendan, what are your thoughts on this? I think it's brilliant. I mean, it's very risky because, you know, it's always risky when you go back to the public and the public is in a bad mood or a grouchy mood or a progressive mood. There are so many moods floating around in the kind of public sphere. So it's unpredictable as to what will happen. It's unpredictable Mm. as to which force in this country will be victorious, so to speak, on election day. But I think it's really exciting. I think it's incredibly important. I think it's brilliant that the, the, the question of Brexit which is fundamentally the question of our time, has been returned to the public, has been returned to the people. Because one of the depressing things over the past three and a half years and over the past two years since the general election has just been the way in which Brexit and the future of the country essentially have become uh, the playthings of an establishment that distanced itself from us more and more with every passing day. Mm. They reneged on their manifesto promises that they made in 2017 to uphold the vote for Brexit. They backtracked on everything that they said they would do in relation to the referendum result. They they just lied to us again and again. They were they behaved in an incredibly deceitful way, giving rise to what people refer to as a zombie parliament, which had no real moral or democratic legitimacy. So um, that the fact that that's how they've behaved over the last two years is what makes this election exciting, because mm. they are now submitting themselves to the judgment of the people, which they have no choice but to do, because we live in a democracy. And I think the judgment of the people it might well be quite fierce and unforgiving, and I hope it will be. There are so many anti-Democrats we need to clear out of the House of Commons, and this is finally our chance to do it. Well, I mean, of course, there are over 50 of them who are are refusing to submit themselves to the judgment of the people. Mm -hmm. Some of the notable Ramonas include Amber Rudd, Heidi Allen, Ken Clark, Oliver Letwin, Joe Johnson, Vince Cable, Owen Smith. I mean, we've won a minor victory for democracy here already, haven't we, Tom? It's already paying off. The only campaign itself hasn't even started yet. I think one of the most galling things of this parliament in particular has been that set of the Remainer parliament of the Ramona parliament who are not only trying to defy the verdict of the referendum trying to upend what we collectively made but are actually defying the will of their own constituents mm. you know first and foremost because many of them represent leave areas but at the same time also because many of them were elected in 2017 often you know on Tory or Labour manifestos pledging to uphold the result. And since then, we've seen this gaggle of them kind of move out of those parties, you know, some of them setting up Change UK and then kind of, you know, running off again to the Lib Dems or some of them still fighting on. So now we're seeing people like Anna Soubry, um, still the leader of Independent Group for Change UK or whatever it's called this week, um, still standing (laughs) in her pro-leave Broxtow um, seat and is almost certain to, you know, go down in flames. That's mm. that's an instant win there. I thought it was interesting as well seeing Heidi Allen, you know, originally of the Tories and then Change UK and now 
until recently a Lib Dem um, MP for South Cambridgeshire. She stepped down. I thought that was really interesting because in her statement, she said that she's sick of the abuse she suffered, all the rest of it, and that it's not a she makes her not want to be an MP. And yet two weeks ago, she was quite happy being an MP, mm. <laughs> representing a party that a very small slice of her electorate actually voted for last time around and doing everything she could to thwart democracy. So again, there is this instant win that we've already seen, which is that layer of MPs um, who really had no excuse whatsoever for the kind of antics they were getting up to in Parliament have already been cleared out. So, you know, even on that level, I think, even though this is an election that's going to be fought across a lot of different fronts and there's going to be a lot of jostling as to whether this is going to be the Brexit election or whether this is going to be the election on any other number of issues. I think it's interesting when you look at the pictures of Boris Johnson, Jeremy Corbyn, Boris very much wanting to make this the Brexit election, Corbyn very much wanting to make this the election about inequality and people power and all the rest of it. Notwithstanding the thing, I think there's clear arguments we made about those two neither of them perfectly representing those causes, shall we say. Mm. It's already clear that that backlash in certain areas is already forming itself. And I think any situation in which the electorate are brought back into this conversation after two years of being very much shut out of it can only really be a good thing. Brendan? Uh, yeah, I think the, you know, the, the fact that we're already clearing out through these kind of resignations or stepping downs of more than 50 MPs is, it demonstrates the, the, the nature of the era we live in, which is that the complete and utter exhaustion of the political system has been exposed. Mm. And it's been exposed by the vote for Brexit because the vote for Brexit was fundamentally a demand to bring politics back to the democratic sphere and to bring political questions and political issues back to the public sphere, back to everyday debate, to um, national debate rather than foreign technocratic lawmaking. So uh, it put enormous pressure on the political class to justify themselves to the people rather than running off and hiding behind the laws made by suits in in Brussels. So it had this incredible effect on the establishment. As we know, it, it, it terrified them beyond belief. They have completely lost control of their senses and their reason over the past three and a half years. They're treating it as the worst thing that's ever happened because for them it is. It is one of the worst things that's ever happened because it demands a, a democratic accountability. Mm. And what we're seeing now, I think, with these people jumping ship, running away and, and you know, no doubt going off, all going climbing up the greasy pole to get comfy jobs in big businesses. What I think we're seeing is is people running away from democratic accountability. And, mm. you know, and they're all dodging the verdict of the people. Uh, you know, so on one level, fair play to Anna Subri because she is facing the electorate, even mm. though the way she's behaved over the past two or three years is despicable, mm. not only to the national vote for Brexit, which she has tried to overthrow, but to, as Tom says, to these people have behaved despicably to their own voters by switching party and switching policy and everything else. So I think what we're witnessing is more than just you know, the falling apart of a kind of knackered House of Commons, which has happened a few times over the past few decades, you know, after the expenses scandal, for mm -hmm. example, that was another era in which it just all felt exhausted and loads of people left or were thrown out. Um, so it has happened that this kind of process has happened. But I think this is even more important because it really reveals a political class that is incapable of democratic accountability and really unwilling to listen to the people in any meaningful way. So th th even the fact that the election is already having this impact on the political elite demonstrates why it's such an important election and why people should use their ballots really wisely to teach the political class a lesson, primarily that lesson being, you are accountable to us, nobody else, and you should not defy our wishes. I mean, mm -hmm. that really is what this election has to say. Well, of course, a lot of the people resigning are, are using the excuse of abuse. You know, yeah. the public are um, sending them all this these waves of abuse and they're being mean to them and criticising the positions mm. they've taken over the past few years. I mean, Tom, what do you make of that? Well, I think what we've seen, particularly in the run-up to the election and the various MPs in the Labour Party and elsewhere voting against the election and, and citing this as a reason, you know, mm. Jess Phillips almost saying, you know, I'm taking my life in my hands if I go out campaigning. That's more or less <laughs> what she was saying um, in the run-up to all those various votes on whether or not we were going to go to the country. 
country, I think it's just become all the more clear that when people talk about this kind of level of abuse and the need for you know them to be sheltered from it, what they really mean is to be sheltered from democratic accountability. Mm. The way in which the supposed toxicness of the debate, the, the idea that there's all these people out there who have been ginned up by the rhetoric of parliament and the press who are ready to you know harass and inflict violence on them and all the rest of it um that is basically just a byword for what they see as just the kind of brutishness and the stupidness of the the british public and how they should be insulated from that kind of verdict that's become so much more clear recently in the way in which the kind of anti-election crew have very much deployed those kinds of arguments i think it's worth just saying just from what brendan was talking there about how much politics has sort of changed is the fact that Two things can be true at the same time about this election. One of which is that there's everything to play for. Things are going to be fought across loads of different fronts. Um, you could easily perceive a situation given how volatile everything is mm. that you could see, you know, a Brexit majority of MPs or an anti-Brexit majority of MPs or a coalition like this among the Remainers or something else on the Leave side, etc. But at the same time, the, and a lot of that stems from obviously the fact that we have a very dysfunctional electoral system. We have very dysfunctional parties which do mm. not represent and wrap themselves around the views and the interests of, of the British people. But we can't underestimate how much things have changed since 2016 and how we're continuing to see that process of democratisation, of greater accountability really setting in. You know, ever since after the referendum, I remember the first question time after that, in which for some reason David Dimbleby was stood in the audience rather than on the table, <laughs> actually on the table. There's been this shift insofar as the relationship between MPs and their constituents. Some of them have obviously responded to this in a terrible way by yeah. reasserting their God-given right to, you know, dictate how politics is done to everyone else. But we are seeing this, these kinds of shifts, whether or not it's those Labour MPs in leave seats who've really begun to profoundly understand their responsibility to uphold their constituents' wishes, or even to the fact that you now see so many Tories, given the fact that they are, have found themselves by kind of historical quirk on the side of this populist revolt. You know, people from the party of Burke talking about how the sovereignty lies with the people and these Mm. people are our bosses. It's having some strange effects in some respects, but I think a lot of that is in response to the fact that the people via the referendum, even via the general election 2017, and certainly now as we're going into this campaign, have reasserted themselves. They have to be responded to in one Mm. way, shape or form. And I think whatever happens on a kind of seat by seat, constituency by constituency, where the swing's going to be kind of basis, the opportunity of this election to push that further um, to the ends of a more democratic politics, I think it's something that we can't. Um, not take up. You're listening to the Spiked Podcast. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher and more. And if your provider allows you to, why not give us a rating and a review while you're there? It really helps new listeners find the show. This week, Donald Trump confirmed the death of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS. When US troops tracked him down, he blew himself up and two of his children. The ISIS leader was responsible for countless atrocities. He and his followers instigated an ethnic cleansing of the Middle East. They tortured people, threw them off buildings, drowned them in cages, burned them alive. They made sex slaves of Yazidi women and girls and forced their boys to become suicide bombers. And yet the reaction has been a little bit odd and there's been a sort of reluctance to condemn Baghdadi outright. Tom, what have you made of this news? There was just this very strange response from a lot of the headline writers and and the obituaries after um, our Baghdadi was confirmed dead. There's been a few that have been swirling around social media. The Washington Post originally ran a headline referring to Baghdadi as the Islamic State's terrorist in chief, which for some reason, the reasons for which I don't think have been confirmed yet, they swiftly changed it to austere religious scholar at the helm of the Islamic State, which is quite strange. <laughs> um, Bloomberg had a more kind of rags to riches take, um, talking about a little known teacher of Quranic recitation who transformed himself <laughs> into the self-proclaimed ruler of an entity that covered swaths of um, Syria and Iraq. So there was this strange <laughs> almost inability to just come out and describe this man as what he is, which was an evil, genocidal, homicidal maniac, you know. Mm. And it's not to say that any of these people at the Washington Post or anywhere else have some kind of like latent pro-Baghdadi, pro-ISIS tendencies, which they're trying (laughs) to cover up or trying to express. It's more the fact that 
there has been, and you've seen it throughout the kind of recent period in relation to um, terrorism and ISIS and other groups like it, of a kind of moral relativism yeah. or a kind of moral disorientation in their ability to um, describe these people for what they are. You know, we've seen this in discussion of, the, of terrorism for the longest time. There is a tendency um, on one hand to see it in some circles as just a product of um, Western imperialism on some level, that these people don't know what they do, that fundamentally we don't hold them to the same moral standard. That's part of the process. Process. Also, just a kind of profound kind of sense of Western self-loathing, you know, which mm. I think feeds into it on some level where, you know, you saw Obama a few years ago when talking in um, the wake of the rise of ISIS and talking about the question of terrorism more broadly suggested that, you know, given the Crusades and everything else, we shouldn't get on our high horse <laughs> about groups mm. like this. Again, none of this is to say that these people have, you know, strange, um, dodgy sympathies with these kinds of groups, but it does speak to the fact that for whatever reason, there is this moral disorientation to the point where even when someone like Baghdadi is killed, someone who, as you said in your introduction, is a completely evil individual who, you know, his group, the Islamic State, is responsible for orchestrating all these attacks. Think of all the attacks we've had in the West, you know, whether it's the Paris attacks or mm. the Berlin attack or the attack in Orlando. All these people personally pledged their allegiance, not just to the Islamic State, but actually to him before they carried out these attacks. And that's notwithstanding, you know, the barbarism that he unleashed in Ir- Iraq and Syria. The fact that that headline writer, their first thoughts are trying to describe him in almost the most neutral way possible, I mm. think is strange to say the least. Yeah, and it, it was interesting that lots of people found more things to object to in in sort of Trump's speech. You know, Trump gave mm-hmm. this actually quite crude speech. Quite of course, funny, really. it was yeah. quite funny <laughs> at, at times. But people really, you know, wanted to pick that apart and complain about it a lot. I mean, one of my favourites was um, Max Boot in the Washington Post, who, who who said, and I quote, "The assertion that Baghdadi died as a coward because Trump said he died like a dog and a coward was." in any case, contradicted by the fact that rather than be captured, he blew himself up. <laughs> now, the implication there is that Baghdadi is somehow brave. Yeah. Boot has, you know, eaten his words and, and has gone back on this. But it, what a bizarre, you know, kind of sentiment to express. Similarly, on, on TV, James Winterfield and Obama aide chastised Trump for, I quote, piling humiliation on ISIS after the mission. And he said, if you look back at the Bin Laden raid, which was obviously overseen by Obama, we treated his body with the respect that is due under Islam. Mm. And, you know, there's this kind of strange desire to, I don't know, almost say that the problem with the Baghdadi killing is that Trump is a bit too crude and, and rough and, and rude. And uh, rather than um, actually dealing with the issue at hand, mm. the, you know, the good news that this murderous terrorist has been killed. Yeah, it's completely and utterly bizarre. And I think it's sometimes quite difficult to get a handle on just how bizarre this is. I mean, as you've described the group, Fraser, they are, they were, you know, one of the most evil organisations of, of modern times, completely despicable and psychotic in some instances, and supremacist and racist and misogynistic and homophobic and all these other things, as we know from their attempt to wipe out the UFCD people, their enslavement of women, their execution of homosexuals, all that stuff, their assaults on Christians, you know, the beheading of Christians in Egypt, the killing of Christians and the destruction of churches in Iraq and Syria. I mean, all this stuff, you know, people in the West, lefties in the West, love to talk about the rise of fascism, by mm. which they usually mean some out of shape white bloke who goes on Reddit in his bedroom and says stupid stuff. They rarely say it about this fairly well organized movement, which wanted to inflict its incredibly supremacist version of Islamist intolerance on any part of the world it could get its hands on. So that's really interesting. But I think there is definitely absolutely this reluctance to talk openly and plainly about the wickedness of the Islamic State. And I think it does come down to the question of Islam. There is just a reluctance to criticise too harshly any group which has Islamist leanings because you will be called Islamophobic. I mean, the, the clearest example, if you think back to you know, the Manchester Arena attack, mm. which no one in this country talks about anymore. 21 young people, including kids, killed at a pop concert. It's kind of been erased from consciousness. It's, it, it's not, it really is not the focal point that you would expect such a significant attack on the nation's children to be because people just felt uncomfortable with strongly condemning an Islamist assault. And they were worried what that, that strong condemnation might lead to Islamophobic sentiment among ordinary people and so on and so forth. Uh, also, Momentum released a video a few weeks ago of 
the rise and rise of violent extremism in the West. And they talked about Charlottesville. They talked about the massacre at the synagogue in Pittsburgh. They talked about various Islamophobic attacks in Europe. They didn't mention one single ISIS attack. They didn't mm. mention the Jewish children who'd been killed in France by Islamist terrorists. They didn't mean, mention the Paris attacks. They didn't mention the Manchester attacks, Berlin, Barcelona, uh, attacks in Finland. They didn't mention any of that because they're embarrassed to mention Islamist extremism, even though they were supposedly talking about violent extremism. So over the past four or five years across the West, we've seen this reluctance to confront the reality of Islamist terrorism, to call it by its name, and and this uh, willingness to turn a blind eye, or at least move on very quickly mm -hmm. from the fact that there was this pretty large, well-organized group of people who were killing people not only in the Middle East, but across the West too. You're listening to The Spike Podcast, Spiked has no subscriptions and no paywalls. All of our content is free. We rely on the generosity of our listeners and readers to keep us going and growing. For those of you who already donate to Spiked, we can't thank you enough. It really means a lot to the team. If you haven't already, then why not consider giving Spiked a donation? You can make a one-off payment or give monthly by going to spiked-online.com. Comedian Dave Chappelle was given the Mark Twain Prize for American Humour this week, and he used this acceptance speech to defend free speech and take on cancel culture. He joked that the First Amendment is first for a reason, the Second Amendment is just in case the first one doesn't work out. Chappelle has always been irreverent and controversial, but since his comeback he's come under enormous fire, in particular for making jokes about the LGBT community, or as he calls them, the alphabet people. Tom, are you pleased to see Chappelle taking this stand? Oh, definitely. Um, and he's doing it so well. And it's, it's so mm. natural that this would fall to people like him, the kind of irreverent comedians. I think what is the great shocking thing is not that supposedly Dave Chappelle is suddenly really unwoke or controversial or whatever. It's the fact that more comedians don't feel the need to prick these pieties which have developed in recent years and to, and to take the mick out of them and to find them funny. I mean, there was so much criticism of his most recent Netflix special, Sticks and Stones, in which he talks about the alphabet people um, he talks about the Jussie Smollett stuff um, he talks about why he doesn't believe Michael Jackson's accusers and, all these other various different things. and again the backlash to it was really really fascinating because again it's the comedians who are supposed to be able to find you know the absurdity in anything mm. um, and certainly the absurdity in, in the people who claim to be so morally self-righteous whether it's you know the religious conservatives of 20 30 years ago or it's the kind of you know woke conservatives almost if you like of today. And yeah. it's, it's funny because watching him do his stand up, it's just so obvious. This is what a comedian's supposed to do. He just can't help himself. <laughs> you know, he has this joke in relation to, again, transgenderism is something he, he can't, he says this in his special, he can't help but make jokes about these people mm. because he's told that he can't do it. And yeah. like, I think what's also interesting is that there's so many people writing these long think pieces about how, you know, I used to love Dave Chappelle back in the day <laughs> and now he's changed. Now he's become a bigot. All of his fans are all the wrong people and all this kind of stuff. But again, if you're familiar with his work, you know that Dave Chappelle hasn't really changed. The world yeah. has changed around him. He's been making Michael Jackson jokes since the early 2000s. You know? yeah. <laughs> There's this great one a few spe in uh, one of his specials from back then where he talks about how the nerve of Michael Jackson's accusers to say that it was abuse when he was just being a very good host. You know, this <laughs> kind of he's, he's always been an edgy comedian. And what I just find so striking is that it, even his you know, self-proclaimed fans in the media seem to think that suddenly he's become gone beyond the pale when it's it's them who have changed rather than him. Brendan? Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, I love Dave Chappelle and I loved the apology he gave where he said, you know, if I've offended anyone, I apologise, yada, 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 et cetera, et cetera, whatever I'm supposed to say. And that's like <laughs> the, the perfect apology that should be given to those mm. kind of people who want an apology simply because you've said something. That's what everyone should say. It's, it, you know, it's bizarre, but you think to yourself, if, if comedians can't push at the edges of acceptable thinking, then nobody can. Yeah. You know, Joan Rivers used to make that point as well. She's very different to Dave Chappelle, but she also was often on the edge of acceptability. You know, that's what their job is. What's fascinating about Chappelle, because I thought his comment about the Constitution was actually 
you know, that's the best description I've heard of the American Constitution in recent times, which is that the First Amendment is the First Amendment because freedom of speech is the most important thing. Mm. And the Second Amendment is there in case the government or the state screws you over and tries to take away your freedoms. I mean, that is the perfect description of those, the first and two, the first and second amendments, which I think are incredibly important documents. But the, the what's striking about Chappelle is that you can tell that and this is what does distinguish him slightly from the kind of, you know, angry right wing mm. or alt right people who have become fans of his, mm. um, by default largely. But you, you can tell that he really, as Tom was saying, he, f- he feels he has to do this. I mean, there's a seriousness to it as well as being very funny. He's not simply kicking the hornet's nest and laughing as all the bees fly out. He's not simply taking the piss out of people because he thinks it will be really funny and 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 wind them up he really feels this pretty deep urge i think to push back against the parameters of acceptable thought and Mm. so there's there's a depth to what he says Mm. as well as it also being funny so i think that's what marks him out because we do live in an era which is quite stifling in terms of what you're allowed to say and think but also one in which there is this new trend to kick back against that in a way that's quite infantile you know you see it amongst the alt-right in particular just this infantile middle finger at political correctness which is usually not very funny and quite grating but i think the role that Chappelle is playing is an incredibly important one because he's doing his job as a comedian making people laugh he's standing up for fundamental freedoms and he's demonstrating to people that it is possible and desirable to defy diktats on what you're supposedly allowed to think and say I mean, the other good thing is that he's winning awards for it. He's being yeah. recognised rather than cancelled, which is what I'm sure a lot of his critics would like to do. That's the great thing about Dave Chappelle is that because he's so brilliant, he's kind of uncancellable, if you know what I mean, <laughs> because just on the sheer weight of his um, talents and how much people love him, mm. he is really doing so much work to kind of clear the ground. And because, as Brendan says, he refuses to apologise. And I think also just on the kind of point about the kind of right-wing attempt to kind of claim him, which I think, or at least the, you know, the fact that the Ben Shapiro's of this world are suddenly huge Dave Chappelle fans <laughs> <laughs> reason. I think it's actually quite interesting watching his stuff, how a lot of the points he tries to make is to try and make the, the left less ridiculous. Mm. You know, he has this great bit in one of his recent um, specials where so- there's like a Q&A section at the end for some reason, because he feels that he has to respond <laughs> to all of this controversy. Someone says, asks him if he thinks Trump's going to be re-elected, and he says, I wouldn't bet against it, because, you know, a lot of it is about how the Democrats are reacting. And at the moment, you know, Trump's grabbing pussy over there, and we're not even letting Joe Biden smell people's hair. That's a kind of, <laughs> it's a funny line, but underneath that is a point about, again, mm. this kind of moral self-righteousness, this mm. absurd wokeness, and all the rest of it, which, if nothing else, is a huge problem for for the left and it being more and more important that people in the kind of more left-wing or liberal kind of cultural sphere recognise this as a problem, want to um, grab it with both hands, but also just on the fundamental point that comedians should feel empowered to take the mick out of anything that presents itself. Yeah, I mean, and, uh, you know, it's even at a more, you know, even at a less um, important, less political level, it's just bad for comedy. And and you think about some of the acts that critics have been wetting themselves over, you know, Hannah Gadsby is the one that comes to mind. And she's said very explicitly that she, you know, often doesn't mind if people don't laugh. She doesn't, doesn't it, it, making people laugh. And the actual task of comedy is secondary to her making a political point about being oppressed. And, you know, it's it's incredibly depressing. And obviously she can say whatever she likes but it, it, it's strange that people have gravitated towards that form of expression and it's really you know it's obviously bad for the art form itself absolutely and you know if you go to comedy clubs in in the u.s but also in the uk it's often quite drab it's often mm. very predictable it's quite formulaic it's unquestionable as far as i can tell that pc whatever that means but we, we all kind of have an instinct of what it means it's unquestionable that it's had a, a, a terrible impact on humor and on culture more broadly and and i think what we we live in a climate in which culture and comedy and all these other things are increasingly judged not by whether they make you laugh or entertain you or move you but by but by whether they say the right thing about Mm. the world and say the right thing about how we should think it's really striking also this week that obama came out against cancelled culture uh, in a fairly limited way but unquestionably a useful intervention where he talked about, you know, the urge to be completely woke and to call out people who are not completely woke is a pretty destructive urge. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to go overboard 
But I do wonder if we are reaching a kind of turning point with woke culture. That's not to say we will suddenly leap into a world of complete freedom. We might go into another form of restraint on what mm-hmm. you're allowed to think and say. But I do think that painful wokeness and the cancel culture, when people as significant as Chappelle and Obama and others are saying, mm, we've had enough of this, I do think we might finally have a welcome turning point to all this crap. You've been listening to The Spike Podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, why not give us a rating, a review, or even a donation? We'll be back next week, but for more great Spiked content, just go to spiked-online.com.